Okay. Now, finally, in conclusion, then, you see, there are Muslims in this audience who have not accepted Christ as in a Christian sense. And we should take it for granted they don't have the Holy Spirit. I don't think I have the Holy Spirit. And I don't think my Muslim friends do. All right. So if we don't have this Holy Spirit, then, we could not understand anything that you're saying about Christ. That's true. That's true. So our dialogue is not going to be promising for anything. There's no way that you can convert our Muslim friends because they don't have the Holy Spirit, so they can't understand you. Until they get the Holy Spirit, they will not understand you. And all you're preaching here is just in vain. Unless the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Unless the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, man, you're in big trouble. <laughs> right. Exactly right. All right. Exactly right. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to all of you who are here today. Inshallah the topic of our debate today is about the essence of the creed that of Christianity and of Islam. Now you will hear today perhaps certain differences between the two creeds. You will hear a very respectful debate. Now I hope sincerely that both sides who are here today will exercise restraint and you will have no takbirs, no hallelujahs or anything of that nature. This is an important part of, of our debate. Today we'll be looking at the essence of the religions. In our climates, in this country and in the United States and in other places, we talk about mutual understanding and tolerance. These all have their places. Today, we'll be talking about truth and our different conceptions of truth, our different positions. So inshallah, those of you who are here today will hear that truth and will act upon it accordingly, inshallah. I have a few announcements where I hope you'll take heed. The first is that the questions and answers which will take place, this will be at the end of the session, but they will be written. So if you will please write them down during the course of the debate if you so wish, and then put them on the table at the end. The second is with respect to cellular phones. Will you please turn off your mobiles? There is nothing more irritating than a phone with a musical sound, it disrupts the whole debate. Inshallah, as to the structure of the debate today, it will start with Dr. David Schenk, who is from the Christian College in Lithuania. He will start by giving his position for 20 minutes. After that time, Brother Shabi Ali from the Islamic Information Center in Toronto in Canada and who is a student in comparative religion, he will give his piece for 20 minutes. Then after that, there will be 10 minutes, a 10 minute presentation by Dr. David Schenk in response to the speech of Shabi Ali. And then Shabi Ali, likewise, will have 10 minutes to respond to Dr. David Schenk. After that, there will be three questions which each speaker will have in respect of the other. At the end of this, inshallah, we'll have a break for also prayers. This will be at 3.45, inshallah. This will be for about 10 minutes. So those of you who need to pray, it will be at the back of the room, and we'll show you the direction of the Qibla, inshallah. Then at the end of this, there will be questions from the audience, which both speakers will address. And at 4.50, will have a five-minute summation from both of the speakers. So inshallah, I hope you enjoy the speech, I hope you enjoy the debate, and that everyone gets the reward and benefit from it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If I may ask Dr. David Schenk to come here, and he'll, inshallah, tell you what the Christian approach is to our topic today. It's just a great privilege for me to be with you today, and a great honor indeed. Um, the hospitality that we have been experiencing is just 
astounding, including last night a good feast at one o'clock of chicken tiki. Is that what it was called? Chicken, chicken tiki. It was delicious um, and gave me very, very happy dreams all night. Thank you so much. One brother, in fact, gave me his bed here in Coventry the other night. Um, so I, I just very, very grateful. Um, <clears throat> for me, uh, the conversation with Muslim friends and brothers has been very precious over the years. And um, um, these dialogues remind me of teaching at the University of Nairobi some years ago with a uh, Muslim colleague called Badru Katrege. He was from Uganda. And um, we taught world religions together, in fact. And uh, we, we uh, decided to, uh, to uh, deepen our dialogue in writing a book. And I suppose that's one reason I've been invited to these meetings, because of that dialogue between Katarek and myself called A Muslim and a Christian in Dialogue. I have a copy of it here, and at the back there are uh, slips of paper you could pick up to look at where you could purchase it. But that was very special, where in the first half of the book he shares his faith with me as a Muslim, and I respond as a Christian to those 12 chapters, and then the last 12 chapters I share my faith, and he responds. Also a book on world religions, which uh, you might want to take a look at as well. But I'm just saying the conversation with Islam for me has been a deep and precious and sometimes difficult and painful experience for the last uh, I'm almost embarrassed to say how many years, 40 years, uh, but it's been a wonderful 40 years. <clears throat> this morning, this afternoon, my, um, my topic that I've been asked to speak on is God in Christian experience. God is my Father, uh, as Jesus taught us to pray, my Father in heaven, and he is the most precious person in my life. Uh, he is the center of my life. He means everything to me. And so it is with great joy that I want to confess this afternoon God as I experience him. And my faith in God is rooted in the Bible. And I want to just walk through some of the images of God, revelation, dimensions of the revelation of God that come to me as I reflect on the Bible uh, day by day. First is the astonishing first statement in the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Totally astounding. This world, this universe did not come about through some impersonal big bang. God put it together by speaking his word. Some years ago, a missionary friend of mine in Tanzania um, returned after having left Tanzania for many years and was way out in the boondocks and a man met her and says, Dorothy Simoka, that was her name, you taught me something as a young man that I have never ever forgotten, changed my whole life. She asked, what is that? He said, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. I experience God as creator and celebrate that reality with great joy day by day even at noon today, eating food of God's creation and experiencing the energy that it gives me for what I'm doing right now. The miracle of it all never ceases to amaze me. Another dimension of God as we experience him in the Bible is his unity within diversity. Again, the first chapter of the Bible, God says, let us make man in our own image. God is one in unity. There is conversation, loving communion within God. The unity of God is not a mathematical one, one, but it is a unity within interpersonal diversity. Let us make God. Foundational to my experience of God is that he is love. And God experiences and expresses that love in, within his own interpersonal conversation as the God who is one in unity with diversity. 
And that unity within diversity, which is our experience of God, beginning right in the first chapter of the Bible, and in the Hebrew, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. That word one also communicates the conviction of unity within diversity. Even Abraham, the word for God Elohim, is a unity within diversity. That unity within diversity means that we celebrate the diversity of church. One of my joys for many years was being involved in a global missions movement, uh, visiting some 40 countries around the world. The church in every culture and country is diverse, very different. That diversity which is part of the church movement is anchored in the theology that sees God as unity within diversity. God, when he created Adam and Eve, gives them astounding responsibility. We are not puppets, but we are commanded by God to develop the good earth, to care for the good earth, and to name the animals. We have responsibility. God does not impose himself upon us, but frees us to be free people even frees us to rebel against him, as Adam and Eve did, turning away from God, rebelling against him, hiding from him behind the bushes. God frees us to do that, to reject him if we so choose. God restrains his authority in order that we might be free. It's amazing. But he expresses his authority. He entered that garden when Adam and Eve turned from him and said, Adam, Eve, where are you? Oh, we're hiding here behind the bushes. Why are you hiding? Adam, where are you? And that is the drama of biblical revelation from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through to the last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22. The 1,500 years of unfolding revelation in the biblical scriptures are the ongoing drama of God entering the garden of our lives, looking for us, the seeking God. Where are you, David? Why are you hiding from me? Where have you gone? Why have you turned away from me? He is the God who pursues because he loves us, seeking us each one in the garden of our life. In biblical revelation, we experience God as the one who calls. He called Abraham. Abraham, leave your family. Leave your people. Leave your religious traditions. Follow me. Abraham experienced God as Elohim, which is analogous to the Allah within Islam. And Abraham obeyed that call and followed God, leaving his country and his people. For me, the call of God likewise has come to me again and again to leave, to leave my country, to leave my people, to say yes to him. God is the God who encounters Moses at the burning bush, drew near. God spoke from that bush. Moses, take off your shoes. The place that you're standing is holy ground. He met Moses. And we read in the scriptures, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, Elohim. But by my name, the Lord Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. God reveals himself to Moses, as Yahweh, the one who encounters personally, the righteous personal one who meets us calling for repentance. He gives Moses a new name. I am, I was, I will be Yahweh. Why does God encounter? Why does he confront Moses in the burning bush? Why does he confront me in personal encounter? 
Why does he seek to encounter you? God encounters because he wants to deliver us from our sin and our rebellion and form us into a covenant people bounded in loyalty only to him. And so God acted with great power to deliver Israel from bondage under Pharaoh. God in that great deliverance reveals himself as the one of justice who is very concerned about the downtrodden and the oppressed in our world. He shows himself strong on their behalf and with great power he intervened in confrontation against Pharaoh's oppressiveness to deliver Israel from that oppression. He is the God of justice who worked not only then but today continues to be the God of justice who confronts injustice with his great anger and great concern wherever it might be found. Let my people go, God said to Pharaoh, that they may worship him. I know during the long struggle for justice in South Africa, I often ask my African friends, when will apartheid ever change? Can it ever change? And every one of the Christian brothers I spoke to and sisters always said, it will change. And I would say, why? They would say, because of God. <laughs> God is the just one. God meets Israel at Mount Sinai. He meets, him with, he meets them with great power. He meets them in fire and smoke. He is the holy God. In that meeting at Mount Sinai, God told Moses, put a boundary around the mountain. Don't let them come near. Wash their clothes. I am the holy one. They should not approach me in their unholiness. We cannot say yes to God in unholiness. To meet God is to repent of our unholiness. To receive him and to say yes to him is a, is a step, an affirmation that we are sinners who need his forgiveness for he alone is the truly holy one. God says there at Mount Sinai, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. He met Israel there to form them into holy people. He is the God of covenant. God is the God who promises. Throughout the biblical scriptures, 1500 years of those scriptures unfolding over and over again, the promise, the promise. We'll talk more about that in the next nights when we talk about the coming of the Messiah. But he promises that hope will come and salvation will come to the ends of the earth through the one who is to come. For example, the promise to David, I will set him your offspring over my house and over my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. God gives hope. He is the God of hope. When Israel was taken into bondage far from home as refugees and slaves in a foreign country, God spoke over and over again of hope. Do not be discouraged. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And in time, this promise of hope was fulfilled in Jesus the Messiah. Jesus, the angel told Mary, called him Jesus. His name will be Jesus. Jesus is Yahweh saves. Yahshua. Yahweh, the God who met Moses at the burning bush, is also Savior, fully present in Jesus, Yahshua, the Messiah. And in Jesus, we meet the God of the whole universe, incarnated, walking among us, and we discover that God is our loving Heavenly Father. Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What a prayer. What an earth-shaking prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We experience God in Jesus as Redeemer, as Savior, as the one who suffers with us and because of us, who embraces us and invites us through his love and redemptive salvation. We also experience God as present now through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised, wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. The crowd were utterly amazed. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. And they broke bread in their homes and ate to together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And day by day, God continues to encounter and reveal himself to us. And he is fully present through the Holy Spirit. Thank you. <clears throat> I begin with praises for Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers, in particular upon the last of all of his prophets, the man Muhammad, after whose name we say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Muslim understanding of God is grounded in reason and in revelation. In Islam, we do not see reason and revelation to be two opposites, but we see them as complementary. Let me begin with reason. If we were to forget about any religions that we have come to believe in, and we were to ask them basic questions, we would discover that there is a God. Uh, for example, we know that from nothing, nothing comes. But we do have something around us. Why is everything here? Where did it come from? It must have come from somewhere. There must be a cause that is sufficient to create the entire universe. And that cause we refer to as God. But what else can we know about this God? We have an experience that uh, things, before they are invented, before they are created, before they are produced, usually have their origin in some intelligent mind. For example, if you were to find a watch in the sand, and you pick it up and you find it to be a working watch, you can well imagine that from your own experience, uh, this watch first originated in the mind of some inventor before it was first represented in blueprints and before it went to the manufacturing stage. And so we must think of the existing universe working in its fine-tuned manner as it is as originating in the mind of a creator or an inventor or a fashioner. In that case, not only should we perceive of the universe as emerging out of some sufficient cause, a powerful force that could bring it into being, but uh, we should also imagine that that creator, whoever that creator is, is uh, possessing of a mind, of an intelligent mind. We can further look at the presence of uh, moral reason among us. We have some sense of morality. Even uh, if you take somebody who is a thief and you ask whether this person has any sense of morality, you will see that this person does. If you steal from him, his sense of justice will be offended and he cries out for justice. Where does this sense of justice come from? Where is this general understanding, for example, that it is wrong to torture a child just for fun come from? These are universal feelings that human beings have. If we are created by some creator who is an intelligent being, we must also imagine that this creator is a moral being who has already imbued us with the sense of moral right and wrong. Our own experience confirms that there is something bigger and greater than us, something that we refer to as God. When somebody is in a difficulty and he cries out for help, to the cosmos or to the creator of the cosmos or whatever is out there. And uh, from the, our religious upbringing, we have an 
experience of using the word God. So somebody in difficulty cries out, God help me. Even one who does not believe in God by profession, at that moment will cry out, God help me. Why? So we see from uh, the reason and experience that there is a God. But there is a limited amount of things that we can learn about that God from reason alone. But having come this far, we should be aware that, in fact, reason guides us somewhat along the way, but not completely. And for that complete guidance, we must rely on revelation from the Almighty God. And this is where I want to now go into. Muslims believe in revelation that has come from God through many prophets and messengers throughout time. Many of these prophets are named in the Hebrew Bible. One prophet is named in the Christian New Testament, Prophet Jesus. And last of all, Muslims believe that God sent a prophet in Arabia some 1400 years ago on a universal mission to spread God's message to all humankind. In addition, Muslims believe that God sent prophets and messengers to all peoples in all times so that everyone should have access to the same one message that there is no God except the one true God who is called Allah in the glorious Quran. Well, let's see what we can learn about this one God through revelation. Before I go into that in some detail, I want to preface my remarks by saying that if somebody comes to you with a book and says, well, here is a revelation from the Almighty God. There are two approaches you can take. One approach is to say, all right, let's just assume that everything in this book is true. And based on that assumption, we will believe everything it tells us about the Almighty God, whose revelation it is supposed to be. Another approach would be to say, let's examine this book and see if really it is a revelation from the Almighty God. And then we can believe in everything that it tells us. Now, I do not have time within this short lecture to go into some detail uh, as to what reasons there might be for believing the Quran to be a revelation from God. But let me just explore some very quick reasons. We see that the Quran, if it were authored by a human being, would have to have been authored by the man Muhammad, whose name I've already mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But could he have really been the author of this book? I would say no, for the following reasons. One, a history has him as an unlettered person. He could not write anything more than his own name, much less a book, and much less a book like the glorious Quran, which is a comprehensive guide for all of human endeavor. Second, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, goes down in history as a man who was sincere. For example, William Montgomery Watt, a man from Edinburgh, having examined the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, concluded that when he said that the Quran was a revelation given to him by the Almighty God, he was sincere in that belief. He wasn't lying to people. He believed that this was a revelation from God. Now we should look to see further whether or not uh, he might have been sincerely wrong, because a man can believe he has a revelation from God, but perhaps that is coming from his own subconscious mind. And that leads me to my third reason. If we examine the psychology of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we see that this book could not have originated from his mind. Why? The book commands him, uh, and on occasion even criticizes him. So that could not be his own production, otherwise he would be some sort of a madman speaking to himself and criticizing himself in his own book. But if he were a madman, he could not have authored a book like the glorious Quran. So uh, we should conclude, based on this psychological examination, that he could not have been the author of this book. My fourth reason has to do with history. If we look back at what the Quran says concerning past history, we see that the Quran re relates accurate history, informing us about things that could not have been known to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or to his contemporaries. Independent investigations prove that the Quran was right in what it said. We see fifth that the Quran speaks about the future, telling us by way of prophecy what will happen in the future, and then the future unfolds exactly as already described in the Quran. Who could have authored a book that would uh, dictate the future like this, unless it is a revelation from the Almighty God? And sixth, we see that the Quran describes physical phenomena around us, telling us things which modern scientists are finding to be amazing uh, to have been recorded already in the seventh century book. Again, who could have authored a book like the glorious Quran, which would describe science in such minute 
and accurate detail. All of these six reasons together, I think, form a strong cumulative case to present the Quran as the word of God to the entire world. I'd like to look by way of confirmation at two negative reasons for also believing the Quran to be the word of God. It's nice to have some positive reasons, but has anyone ever checked it out to see if perhaps it can be disproved? The Quran itself offers two ways in which one might try to disprove it. One is to find errors in the book. In Surah 4, verse 82, the Quran says that if it had not been from God, you would have surely found therein many discrepancies. Although many people have wasted their lives trying to find error in this book, nobody has been able to come up with any example of a genuine error. Although they have shown us some examples of their misunderstanding and misinterpretation of the text. Second, the Quran challenges humankind to disprove this book by producing one like it. This book claims to be of divine origin. If it were of human origin as its critics would want to believe, then the Quran's position is simply this. If it is of human origin, then other humans can also likewise produce one like it. And if nobody's able to produce one like it, this just simply establishes the divine origin of the book. Although there have been many opponents of the Quran, many enemies throughout the centuries, and although many people have given much to try and oppose the Quran, nobody has been able to produce a book like this one. Why? Millions of books have been written in the world, but not a, not a book like this one. Again, the divine origin of this book is established. So then we can safely look into this book to see what does it tell us about the God that we have already discovered through reason. The Quran tells us that there is only one God. And the Quran stresses a lot uh, about the, omnipotent, uh, the omnipotence and the omniscience of this one God. This is a God who is capable of doing whatever he wishes. The Quran describes him as fa'alu lima yurid. He accomplishes or he does whatever he desires, whatever he intends. The Quran stresses the knowledge of this God. The Quran tells us that la yakhfa alayhi shay'un fil ardi wa la fis sama. Nothing is hidden from him, either in the he in, on the earth or in the heavens. He is alimul ghaybi wa shahada. He is the knower of the open and uh, the hidden the secret and the manifest. So God's omnipotence and omniscience are stressed in the Quran. Now this is done for a very important reason. Once th this is shown to us to be the essential characteristics of God, we can distinguish between the true God and any false God. For example, if one is incapable of doing something, then this is not the true God. If there is one single limitation in his power, that is not the true God. Moreover, if one does not know everything, that cannot be the true God. If there is one thing that somebody does not know, he cannot be the true God. Moreover, the Quran stresses the greatness of God and tells us through the story of Abraham how to discover, in fact, who really is God by a process of elimination. Anyone who has something greater than itself cannot be the true God. In fact, this reminds us of St. Anselm's of, uh, of Canterbury's uh, ontological argument for the existence of God, where he said that God is the thing which, uh, beyond which nothing greater can be imagined. It's a Christian uh, philosopher. Uh, but he had this understanding that God is the greatest. So then by a process of elimination, you see in the story of Abraham, that Abraham saw the star and said, okay, well, this sets, so that cannot be God. And then uh, he looks at the moon and says, all right, so this sets also, that cannot be God. The interesting thing is that when he looked at the sun, he said, okay, this is God, this is greater. And, and that just stresses the understanding that the thing which is greater than everything else, that is God. So if one has someone greater than himself, that one cannot be God, but God is the greatest. As Muslims would say, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest. Now apart from the greatness, the omniscience and the, um, the omnipotence of God, the mercy and forgiveness of God is stressed in the glorious Quran. God tells us that He is merciful, He is forgiving. Uh, the Quran says, Katabar Rabbukum ala nafsihi rahmah. Your Lord has uh, written for Himself, has prescribed for Himself mercy. And God will extend this mercy to whomsoever He pleases. God will extend this mercy and His forgiveness to anyone who turns back to Him repentant and seeking His forgiveness. So Muslims understand then that human beings are not in a depraved state. 
Anyone can rescue himself, anyone can save himself from a, safe, from a position of deprivation by just simply lifting his hands and asking God for his help, for his guidance, and for his forgiveness. In that sense, then, a Muslim does not look outside of himself for some savior beyond and in addition to God. The prophets of God have brought the saving message from God. A Muslim is just simply taught to embrace that saving message, whether it has come through the prophet Moses or through Jesus or through Muhammad, peace be upon him. And especially since Muhammad, peace be upon him, has now come with the culminating message of all of these prophets, that is the message that a Muslim would now grasp upon in order to have this saving relationship with his God. Finally, something must be said about Jesus and his relationship to the one God. Uh, since we have seen that God knows everything, Jesus cannot qualify to be God according to the glorious Quran. Since God is the greatest, Jesus does not qualify because God is greater than him. Since God uh, is able to do whatever he intends, Jesus is not that God because on, on occasion we have seen that he has human limitations and weaknesses. And uh, finally, the mercy of God is such that we do not need somebody to die for us on a cross to be our Lord and Savior in addition to the Almighty an omnipotent and omnipresent God. So the one God of the glorious Quran, Allah, as we call him in the Arabic language, that is the one God that the Quran stresses again and again. That is the God that we have discovered through reason and is now confirmed through the revelation from the Almighty God. That is the God to whom I invite all of you. Thank you. I would like to call upon Dr. David Shank to respond to Brother Shabi Ali's speech. I want to uh, focus on, um, on the first part of the presentation, the role of reason in uh, discovering truth. Um, and certainly, um, and, and, and revelation, which is a helpful uh, contributor to the discovery of truth. One of my particular areas of interest is studying world religions. In fact, I teach world religions, and I, as you know, I've written some books related to this. And um, one of the perplexities when one studies world religions is that this statement in Genesis chapter 1-1, in the beginning God created, is not found in faiths outside of the Abrahamic faiths of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Um, some years ago, there was a um, book written called The Old Testament Against This Environment by a fellow called Wilson. He was part of the um, uh, John Hopkins um, School of Archaeology, uh, which was headed up by William F. Albright, who is, by any measuring stick, in my judgment, the most outstanding archaeologist of the 20th century. William Albright and his school of archaeologists there at John Hopkins University in Baltimore um, invested many years of deep scholarly research into the religious environment at the time that the New Testament developed. Now, at that time, when Albright began his studies, the assumption of most Western scholarship was that the theology of the belief in God has been an evolutionary thing, um, and that the Bible somehow evolved out of the milieu of the Middle Eastern religions into the monotheism that is uh, biblical. But as they probed, the religious milieu in which the Old Testament happened they found no evidence of any evolution toward the belief in one God. If you're studying Egyptian religions or Babylonian religions or Palestinian religions, Canaanitish religions, they believed that God and nature are one. Oh, we know that even in our high school books we read about this monotheism that developed in Egypt when Aten was worshipped the sun god. Oh, that's monotheism. It's nature worship. Aten is the sun god. Pharaoh is the son of the sun god. It's not anywhere near the biblical conviction that God created the sun 
and the stars and the moon. Abraham, who came out of Haran, his people worshipped, the people from whom God said leave, worshipped the moon god. They called the moon god Sin. And according to the traditions, they actually offered children to this moon god. It was the veneration and worship of nature. Now Albright and his cluster of scholars say, how could it be that the Old Testament develops in that kind of a milieu with the deep conviction God created the heavens and the earth? Now, Pharaoh and the Egyptians were very intelligent, highly educated people. They had the University of Heliopolis down there. The Babylonians had developed a very high civilization, but no notions that God created the heavens and the earth. And Albright says, the only reasonable conclusion is that that conviction, God created the heavens and the earth, came through revelation. Full stop. Now when I study other world religions contemporarily, like Hinduism or Buddhism or Confucianism and so forth, I don't find in those faiths a conviction that God created the heavens and the earth. Hinduism says everything is God. I can kneel down and worship this table. It's God. Everything is God. 330 million divinities. God created the heavens and the earth. It's not to be found in Hinduism. Buddha, Buddha doubted if there is a God. He said if people want to worship a God, that's okay. But frankly, I think it's nonsense. I don't think there's any God around anywhere. Buddha was a very intelligent philosopher. But no notion that there's a creator God. Confucius likewise. God? Doubt it. Maybe. But I don't see any evidence of God around. Science? Science probes the mysteries of creation, explores its intricate development, and it's amazing, astounding. Do scientists, simply by studying the wonders of nature, come to the conviction that there's a creator God? Maybe, sometimes, I don't think so. Might find one, one a scientist once in a while says, you know, there is design here, I wonder where it came from, then discovers the Bible and the Quran and says, oh, it must be there's a creator. The point I'm trying to make is that as I see it, um, and I don't stand alone in saying that, as I see it, as the Bible sees it, the rebellion which entered the human race at the time when Adam and Eve turned away from God is so deep and so pernicious within all cultures everywhere that through reason alone we do not discover God. It is through the gift of revelation. That's how we meet God and discover Him. I am very skeptical about human reason being able to reveal God to us or discover God. I don't see that. I don't see that. I read a book just a couple years ago by scientist in Australia, Davies by name, Paul Davis. Paul Davies called the mind of God. He's a physicist and talks about the amazing structure of the universe, complex design, all pointing in one direction, the formation and sustaining of humankind, he says. Very interesting book. Design, design, design. The last chapter of the book, he says, biblical theism does make a lot of sense, but he's not a believer. He's not a believer. He doesn't believe that God created. He just says, if <laughs> one were a Christian, that would explain what's going on. But just the mechanisms of scientific inquiry and so forth surely support the notion that there's a God. But unless one is ready to receive the gift of revelation, I don't think it persuades anybody. Why? Our sin is so pernicious. How much more time do I have? One minute? Let me tell you a story. When I was doing my doctoral dissertation, there was a Hans, a Ron, a Ron Uncheck, who was working on his doctoral dissertation at the same time. And one day we were driving down the expressway together. He was an atheist. 
I said to Ron, when are you going to become a Christian? Never. I pulled off the expressway. I stopped the car. I said, make a fist. He made a fist. Open your hand. He opened his hand. I said, this amazing phenomenon of your brain instructing your hand to make a fist and then open it up. Do you mean that that came together through simply impersonal natural laws? Yes, he said, I believe that the theory of evolution has disproved the God hypothesis. I said, do you really believe that, not Ron? Dave, there's got to be a God, but I'm an atheist. I said, why? He said, I hate my, dad, my dad's guts. And if I ever believed I'd have to get right with my dad, I will never do that. It seems to me that uh, what David has just said uh, was an attempt to say two things at, at once, and the two things do not seem to agree. On the one hand, David has tried to stress that human beings have uh, fallen so much as a result of the sin of Adam that human beings could not discover God through reason. Reason, according to um, the first part of his presentation, uh, fails us to discover God. And as such, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and many other religions that he has studied could not really discover God. But then, uh, towards the end of his uh, presentation, I found David saying that science actually supports the belief in God. And this was the whole point of uh, discussing Paul Davies and the books that Paul Davies has written. In fact, Paul Davies has moved from being an atheist to being uh, a theist of some sort. Um, and such, uh, Paul Davies could say that the, the Christian faith in God is supported by his discoveries in, in science, as uh, David has just said. David's little story about his uh, encounter with this man also shows that David is using reason to support the belief in God. And this is the extent to which I have used uh, the, uh, the, the, the value of reason in discovering God. I've said that uh, reason can take us only so far, but in, in, in the end we have to depend on revelation uh, in order to fully and properly understand God. So I think that David and I are on some level here of agreement, although David saw some disagreement and tried to express that. But I think he's tried to express that by saying two different things which do not agree. Now I'd like to respond in a few minutes to some of the things that David said in his opening presentation, uh, where he spoke about uh, the, the diversity within the unity of God. Now, of course, uh, Christians have come through the Christian experience, reading the writings of Paul, reading the later Gospels about Jesus, and reading the other writings, uh, having inherited the doctrines that have been presented by the church councils, like the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, and other councils after that. And now Christians reinterpret the Old Testament in order to make the Old Testament agree with the later church pronouncements. Well, that's a very difficult task. It uh, has some insurmountable problems. For example, Christians go to the book of Genesis where God says, let us make man in our image. Now, if you focus just on that us there for a minute, you might lose the big picture. The big picture is this, that there's a long history of the Israelite people lasting for thousands of years. They had many prophets and messengers from God coming to them. Many of these prophets are spoken about in, in the Hebrew Bible, which is also now part of the Christian Bible. Do you find any of these prophets saying that God is a trinity? No. In fact, the word trinity is not in the Bible, as David himself has pointed out a couple of nights ago in, in our recent discussions. So that's the big picture. The big picture is that none of these prophets were speaking about a plurality within a unity of God. All of them were just speaking about one God, one God, one God. For example, in the book of uh, Isaiah, in chapter 44, in verse 24, Isaiah uh, writes about Yahweh, the one true God, that uh, this God says that when he created the heavens and the earth, he was alone. There was no one with him. Now the problem is that if you say that there is a, a, another God apart from Yahweh, then you're disagreeing with the Bible. If you say that Yahweh is a trinity, and so you include the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all within Yahweh, then look at the difficulty. David has said that uh, the Old Testament spoke about the Messiah who is to come in the future. And that Messiah turns out to be Jesus. Now is that Messiah Jesus part of Yahweh? 
or not? I would say he is not part of Yahweh. Because notice that in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 42, verse 1, Yahweh speaks about his servant whom he sends. That's the Old Testament. So Yahweh, the one God, says, I'm going to send my servant. Now we go to the New Testament. The New Testament is written about Jesus. We go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 18. And Matthew, the writer, is telling us again about that passage in the Old Testament, saying, you know, go back and read yeah, what Yahweh said there. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. What does Yahweh say? He says he's going to send his servant. Who is the servant? Jesus. Now the New Testament confirms the Old. The Old says Yahweh is going to send his servant. The New says Yahweh did send his servant. And who is that servant? Jesus. So Jesus is not Yahweh. So if Yahweh is the only God, he's not Jesus. So that is where I would rest my contention. I would say, very simply, that uh, there is only one God in the Old Testament and he's not a plurality within a diversity. What about this name Yahweh? Is this really the name of God? I would say no. In fact, uh, David uh, spoke about how Moses received this name of God uh, when God spoke to him. And this is related in the book of Exodus in chapter 3, verse 14, where Moses asks for the name of God and God says, I am what I am. But notice he didn't say my name is Yahweh. He just said, I am what I am. And uh, many uh, biblical commentators have pointed out that this reply from God is to the effect of saying, go mind your own business. What do you mean what my name is? I am what I am. In other words, I won't tell you what my name is. Just go and tell the people, I am has sent me to you. So from this name, I am, we get Yahweh, which means he is. So that's people referring to God, not knowing his name and saying, okay, he is. Because God said to Moses, go and tell them, Ehye, Esher, Ehye, I am who I am. And from Ehye, I am, they have constructed Yahweh, which means he is. But that's not the name of God. That's like saying in Arabic, Hua, he is. But now what about this plurality thing? Why does God say, let us make man in our image? Assuming this text to be correct, it has a reasonable interpretation, which would fit within the context of all of the preaching that we see from the Hebrew prophets. They all preached about one God. Can that one God say, let us make man in our image? Yes. Even in our English language, we can say us when we mean just simply me. In fact, kings can speak that way. Queen Victoria of England used to say, we Victoria, by grace of God, queen. Why does she say we Victoria when she's only one lady? She can. The kings of this earth can say um, can, uh, can use that majestic plural uh, in reference to themselves. And so God can also use that majestic plural in self-reference. That does not pl prove a plurality of persons within the Godhead, but it just simply uh, refers back to the one true God. Now David spoke about uh, the Christian experience of God as Father, as Savior, the Son, and as the Holy Spirit. I'm going to speak a little bit about that experience because it ties in with my opening presentation when I spoke also in addition to reason I spoke about the experience that we have of God. Now, I'd like you to consider what happens for example when you do not believe in any religion and you just simply rely on the pure unadulterated reason and experience. That was my whole point from the beginning. Not turning to revelation first, but turning just simply to your own use of reason and to your experience. Do you experience God as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? I don't think so. I think you would experience that there's something bigger, greater than yourselves. I think you would experience that reason dictates that there is a creator, a fashioner of the, of the universe. That this is an intelligent being. That this is a moral being. But never will you arrive at three or five or a plurality of gods. In fact, if you were to use reason, uh, Occam's razor determines that we should shave off every unnecessary belief and every unnecessary proposition. 
So we should not multiply beings beyond necessity. So we should think of only one God. If one God is sufficient for bringing everything into existence, then it is one God that you should posit, not three and not several. So we do not experience God that way. It is only through Christian experience that God is experienced as Father, as Son, and Holy Ghost. But we can see that this experience is a deviation, a diversion from, and a digression away from the message of all of the Hebrew prophets who preached from beginning to end that there was only one God. And what did Jesus on whom be peace preach? Did he preach a trinity? No. David has admitted that trinity does not exist anywhere in the Bible. Jesus on whom be peace preached that there is only one God. In Mark chapter 12, verse 27 and forward, he repeated the same message of the Hebrew prophets. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And it is to this one Lord, this one God, that I invite again all of you. Thank you. I guess my question comes first, right? Okay, sure. <laughs> Since you're like... Why, um, on, on the question of reason and revelation, um, I was not intending to say, I'm glad for your comments, because I might have been misunderstood. I was not intending to say that belief in God is unreasonable. Mm. No, I believe it is the only reasonable answer for the creation of the world, for the formation of the world, and so forth. I think it is most reasonable. Um, the point I was trying to make, though, is that apart from revelation, people do not come to that conclusion. So even someone like Paul Davies, with all of that research, he says, yes, biblical theism makes a lot of sense, but unless he's ready to receive that revelation, he still is not a believer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that's the point I was going to make. Now my question to you is, um, am I clear in hearing you say that without any revelation, no exposure to Koran or to Bible, without any of the revelation that has come through the Abrahamic movement, no revelation from God, that a person alone, just through reason, would come to the conviction that there is a creator God? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's my question, without any revelation. Yes, my answer, uh, just simply put, is, is yes. In fact, this is how Islam uh, sees the, the value of human reason. Uh, Islam speaks about uh, the Deen al-Fitra, the natural religion. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, uh, said that every child is born a Muslim. That is, as a submitter to God. It is uh, his parents that turn him into a Jew or Christian, or for that matter, for, uh, into something else. It is the, the environment that, that shapes the later understanding of people. But if, uh, if a child is left to one's own, that child would be very responsive uh, towards uh, God. If somebody grows up in an island, for example, just him and his coconut tree, uh, you know, he, he looks up into the heavens and he says, you know, whatever you are out there, you know, I believe in you. So to, to a Muslim, this is the natural state. And in fact, um, uh, although you have mentioned uh, the, the failure of Hinduism and, and Buddhism uh, to come to uh, monotheism, uh, you, you still see that there is, a, there, there is an inborn tendency there to, to actually push towards monotheism. Although there are 330 million gods, as you have uh, pointed out, I Hindu philosophers have a way of working all of that into some concept of one god. There is some desire uh, to come to an uh, understanding of one god. Uh, if you look at the ancient Greek philosophers, Plato and Aristotle, I mean, where do we get all these arguments, philosophical arguments for the existence of God? They go back to Aristotle, the cosmological ar argument, the teleological argument. All of that go back to Aristotle, who is said to be the father of modern philosophy. And in fact, uh, although philosophy at one time had uh, moved away from belief in God, um, modern philosophers are actually uh, re-examining that and turning back to belief in God. For example, Tom Morris, uh, a philosopher and author of the book Philosophy for Dummies, of all, uh, of all uh, books, uh, has uh, actually shown convincing uh, evidence that a number of uh, modern philosophers are actually coming out openly and, and saying that from their philosophy they are convinced that God exists. Um, let me push it just a bit further. Um, but we're talking about biblical faith. We're, we're, talking, about, we're talking about the belief in, in, um, in, the, in the Creator God who, um, who, who, who encounters, who reveals. That's biblical faith. 
the Creator God who encounters and reveals, would one discover that the Creator God encounters and reveals just through reason? I'm not sure like, I understand like, your like question. Aristotle, Aristotle says mm -hmm. there's there's or Plato, you know, this is universal ideal good, but it's not it's it, it but it's a, it, you know it's just a principle. There, there's nothing personal about it. Mm -hmm. But the biblical God is the personal righteous one who encounters, mm -hmm. and that that's what I'm trying to get at. I do not I do not perceive that outside of Revelation, people meet the righteous personal God who encounters. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, yeah. Yes, I think we, we agree on that. In, even in my opening presentation, I did not say that reason will take us the full length of the way. And we still rely on revelation to complete that uh, initial discovery through reason that there is a God. Who exactly is this God and what should be our response to that God? You spoke about Paul Davies believing in God but not uh, being able to make... He didn't believe. He just said it makes sense. Makes sense, all right. But he's not able to make that, um, you know, personal commitment with, with the God or to finally make that faith conviction. Um, so, yes, we do rely on revelation along the way, but the reason takes us only so far. Okay. Uh, I spoke in my talk about the Hebrew prophets all speaking about the one the true God. And uh, what, what we should find... For, uh, in, in your discussion here is where do we go from the one God to now discover in Christian experience that there is the Father, the Son and, and the Holy Ghost. Now specifically if Jesus is, is God for us to have this experience of him as God there must have been something he did or something he said that would establish that he is God. It has to be something definitive I would think because a human being uh, looks like a human being, he doesn't look like God. You don't look like God, I don't look like God. If either of us were to claim to be God, there has to be some way of claiming it, either by something we say or something we do. And it shouldn't be ambiguous, otherwise if I said something that sounds like, you know, I'm saying I'm God, people would say I didn't mean that. Like you just said in your opening speech that, uh, you know, uh, let us make God, but you, you meant let us make man. Oh, I'm sorry, that's a make yes. God. And that's okay. And that's okay because that's, uh, you know, that's what human beings are. We make mistakes. So if you, me. <laughs> if I made, if I said, you know, I am, I am God, everybody would think, oh, Shabir has made a mistake. Certainly he didn't mean to say that. You see? So then, there must be something that Jesus said that is so firm so definitive to establish that he is God. Not something that we can interpret, because if we can interpret another way, we would say, okay, he didn't mean that, because obviously he's a man. Or something he did that is so definitive that will convince us that he is God. What is this thing? Either that he said or that he did. Uh, an excellent, an excellent question. Um, Jesus, at the time when he was baptized, um, God himself spoke from heaven saying this is my beloved son. Later on in the midst of his ministry Jesus went up on a mountain of transfiguration with um, um, uh, Peter, James and John. And um, in that vision on that mountain Elijah appeared and Moses appeared and conversed with Jesus. Then a voice came from heaven saying this is my beloved son, hear ye him. And Elijah and Moses left. Only Jesus was there. A very clear statement from God himself that Jesus supersedes Moses and Elijah, who was the great miracle work of the Old Testament. Um, sometime later, Peter writes that account about the mountain, which appears in Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, and um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that account on the mountain, Peter says, I was there and it really happened. That's God speaking. Jesus himself said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus said, if you want to see the Father, look at me. Jesus said, um, at the end of history, 
you will see the Son of Man coming with all the holy angels with him to judge the world. Jesus healed the sick. He broke bread and fed the hungry. He cast out demons. He raised the dead. He functioned with utmost authority. Um, when the disciples said to him, when Peter said to him, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, when we talk like that, we're not talking about two gods. The biblical language is God, Yahweh, the Father, was in the Messiah. He revealed himself in the Messiah in fullness. John's Gospel refers to Jesus as the Word of God. The Word of God is personal. The Word of God is creative. It is through the word that the universe is created. God speaks and it happens. The word of God is the full expression of who God is. In Jesus the Messiah, the word is fully revealed. So when we meet the Messiah, we're meeting God's word in human form, fully revealed. Now, our language is always inadequate to fully explain how you say that theologically. Augustine once said... <laughs> We say Trinity because we cannot be silent. It is a human attempt to express how we have experienced God in Jesus the Messiah and through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit today and I had wonderful fellowship before I came to this meeting. Holy Spirit giving counsel, uh, opening me, my mind to the truth and so forth. It's the Spirit is at work and Jesus the Messiah is at work redemptively. That's how we experience God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think any of these things are definitive because if you take the Son of God sayings, um, you know, Son of God within the Hebrew context would just mean a righteous person. For example, David was called the only begotten Son of God, or at least the begotten Son of God. And you can't have two who are only begotten. Uh, Psalm 2, verse 7, God said to David, You are my son. This day I have begotten you. So uh, I think, none of I this... think Chris, Christian theology believes that this is referring to the son who will come, because God promised yeah, but David then, that his son see, will come. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. You see, yeah. in, in response to my request for a definitive mm -hmm. answer, mm -hmm. here you go into a circular reasoning, because first you accept Jesus to be the only begotten son of God, and then you go back to that psalm of David, and you say, okay, that one refers to Jesus too. But if you didn't already accept Jesus as the only begotten son of God, in a, in a Christian sense of his being divine, then you read Psalm in its natural context, authored by David. God speaks to David, and this is what God says to David. This is how it was interpreted yes, by yeah, Jews, you see? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, what I'm saying yeah, then is yeah. that within the mm -hmm. Jewish context, mm -hmm. uh, this passage was understood to be referring to David, and that did not make David God. So calling someone son of God, or calling someone even begotten son of God, did not make that person God. So I'm still asking for something that is divini definitive, like something Jesus said that is so clear, applies only to him, and that definitely means that he is God. I I'll go a little further. You spoke about Jesus saying that all authority has been given to him. Well, that doesn't prove that he is God, because if authority is given to him, then the giver is someone else. And that someone else who has that much authority to be able to give that to Jesus, more qualifies to be God. In the light of my previous discussion about who is greater, if there is someone greater than Jesus, then Jesus is not God. The one who is Akbar, who is greater, he is more deserving to be called God. You see? So none of the things that you said is definitive to my understanding is really definitive to really prove that he is God. And so we should accept Jesus as a human being. Everybody agrees that he was so. And unless there is something so definitive and so clear to make him God, there's no reason to think that he is God. In, in fact, there is better reason to reinterpret anything that might make him look like God in, in the context of Jewish history and the unfolding of the message of the Hebrew prophets. Just as we would reinterpret your words and we say, okay, you know, David said that, but he obviously couldn't mean that. He meant the other thing. 
Uh, similarly, we should reinterpret the words of Jesus as they are found in the Bible, assuming that these are his words, and say, okay, he couldn't amend that. He could amend the other thing. Um, you are, you're, your first part of your comment, you're right on that uh, as Christians we interpret the Old Testament through Jesus Christ. That's true. Um, now, if you were a Jewish person who does not accept that Jesus is the Messiah, the scriptures go up to Malachi and then it stops there. You know? And so you don't interpret the Old Testament in the light of Jesus. They're still looking for the Messiah to come. But as Christians we believe, as Muslims do likewise, that Jesus is the Messiah and so we look at the Old Testament through what we call a Christ-centered hermeneutic. And you're right on about that. So prophecies like this to David and so forth, we see that in the light of Jesus. That is true. Now, um, if, but if, 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 if I... Is that, isn't that circular reasoning? Well, I How don't do you... think so. I don't think so. I, I don't think... You, you've, you've, well, you, you've done this relationship to the quarter and these whole four times. We've been talking together three times. You, before, you know, you interpret the Bible in the light of the Quran. Yes, but you know, is, okay, hold on. Hold I, on. I, I feel yes. uncomfortable doing that, Let me but we interpret the Bible is... in the light of Jesus. Okay, but and I don't explain. claim you have circular reason for doing that. No, okay. We believe Jesus mm -hmm. is the full in history revelation of God's truth, mm -hmm. and we interpret all the scriptures in the light of Jesus, and Jesus said, we should do that. Mm -hmm. He said, you search the scriptures, they are they which give witness to me. I'm the center point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let yes. me uh, mm -hmm. just comment on this point about circular reasoning. Uh, first, to avoid circular reasoning myself, what I've done with the Quran is I've used independent, historic, and, and reasonable arguments uh, to first establish the Quran to be the Word of God. So if the Quran is established through such independent reasons to be the Word of God, then I can use that as the basis to interpret other things, because now this is the definitive Word of God, established through independent reasons. So I've avoided circular reasoning there. Now, in your case, if you are going to reinterpret the Old Testament in the light of a Christ-centered hermeneutic, as you have said, then it means first you accept Jesus as, as second person of the Holy Trinity. And then you go back to the Old Testament and you say, oh, well, when it said us, that really means the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. But what you have to do is you have to transport your mind to first century Palestine. And Jesus is there preaching. And there are three kinds of people in the crowd. One group of people says, you know, this guy is boring, let's get out of here, we got something better to do. Another group of people says, you know, this guy is telling the truth, we believe him. A third group of people are saying, well, this guy is dangerous, let's crucify him. All right, now, you're in, you're in the middle group. You're in the group of people and I'll be with you, we want to believe in him. But what would we believe about him? We're Jews, after all, right? If we're there, we're listening to his preachings. We know about the Hebrew prophets. We know what they've said. God is only one. And that's a firm conviction. We've got it on our foreheads. We've got it tied around our wrists. You know, we're sure about that. So if he tells us he is God, what, we shouldn't believe him. If he seems to be saying he is God, we should reinterpret because we're believers. We would like to interpret his words in a good light. If he says something clearly indicating that he is God, now we have a choice. Either we believe he is Yahweh himself, or we believe he's a blasphemer. So there has to be something definitive that he says before we can believe that he is Yahweh himself. Notice there would be no trinity yet. That has to be formulated later. That's right. And so mm -hmm. to avoid circular reasoning, you have to now mm -hmm. ask your question, mm -hmm. what would you have decided at that time? Is mm -hmm. there something definitive that Jesus said would have proven right away that he is Yahweh himself? Let me tell you what I think would have been definitive. If Jesus had come and said, look, you have read the Old Testament. Yahweh said he's the only God. I'd like to tell you, in fact, that I am Yahweh. Now, I know you're, what you're thinking. You're thinking that Yahweh couldn't be a man but in fact I am Yahweh a man. And I know you're thinking that I already said that I am not a man, but in the meantime I've changed my mind and here I am, I am now a man. I would think that that is very definitive. Now we would still have to ask ourselves, do we want to believe this guy or not? Because he seems to be selling, telling something contradictory to what's in the Old Testament, but at least this is definitive. It shows that the speaker knows what the audience is thinking. Like if you're a writer, you know what the audience is thinking. You're trying to clarify their doubts, their objections as you go. So if Jesus is Yahweh, 
He already told us in the Old Testament that he's not a man. He told us that he's only one God. And now he comes in a limited form, which Yahweh is not. Then he has to explain himself in a clear, definitive way. He can't beat around the bush here, otherwise we would reinterpret his words. If he says, I and the Father are one, we would say, yeah, maybe one team. They're on the same side. The devil is on the other side trying to pluck his disciples away from him. But he's saying, nobody can take them away from my hands because I and the Father are one. He says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Now, either he is the Father or he is not. You say he is not because he's the Son. So this, these words do not provide definitive proof that he is God. So, you know, you have to really explain yourself out of this circular reasoning here. It's interesting that um, when Peter made the confession, we believe and are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, don't tell anybody that. I, was teach, I teach theology at the Lithuania Christian College, and just last uh, Friday, I was asking my theology students, why did Jesus say that? Don't tell anybody who I am. And one of the theology students put up his hand. He said, I believe it's because one can only come to that conviction alone and through the Spirit of God. So I um, am not here, and I believe that's right, I'm not here today to prove that Jesus is who he claimed to be. Um, that is for you yourself to discern as you read the Gospels. I plead with you, read the Gospels and ask yourselves, who is this man? Who is he? Now Jesus never ever said, I am Yahweh. No. But he did say, if you see me, you've seen the Father. He said that everything the Father wants me to do, I do. Jesus said, Jesus at one point shocked people when the paralytic was brought down through the roof of the house. And there in the center of the room, the first thing Jesus says to him is, your sins are forgiven. And everybody mumbled around the edges saying, only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said, that authority has been given to the Son of Man, which was the favorite name that Jesus used for himself. And he said, to show that that authority is given to me, get up and get well. And the fellow jumped up, the paralytic got well and walked out. Jesus forgave sins. Only God can forgive sins. But with humility and authority, he exercised that authority that is God's authority. Um, if I were to say to you today, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me, you'd say, I'm totally crazy. But Jesus said that. Was he totally crazy? Was he blaspheming? Or is all authority given to him by God? That's the question we face. And um, Jesus didn't try to prove it to anybody. My job isn't to prove it, but to invite you, take a look. Take a look. But you see there, even your question implies that God is someone else. You asked, is all authority given to him by God? Yeah. So him here refers to Jesus and God refers to someone else. So yeah. but, but here again, in, my, in response to my request for a definitive proof that Jesus is God, this cannot be it. This can only prove that he's something great. Yes, he has a lot of authority given to him mm -hmm. by God, but mm -hmm. it still establishes that he is not God. So he might be something great, maybe greater than what Muslims would believe. That's true. Muslims would question the, the authenticity of this very saying. But even if we accept the authenticity of this saying, we wouldn't conclude that Jesus is God. We would conclude that he's someone special to whom God gave all authority. But God here always refers to someone else, you see. Now, in your see, answer... That, that, that's why in Trinitarian mm -hmm. theology, we talk about a relationship within God. Mm -hmm. The relationship of Father and Son and Holy Spirit. It's, it's a relational it's a relational thing, um, and it's a very precious relational uh, relationship. It's a bonded, it's a unity, it's, it's a oneness to be sure, but it's relational. Uh, it, Jesus walked through life very clearly where he is in relationship with God. He's not independent of God, 
but that he is walking with God in such a way that God, that, that everything he does is the presence and work of God. Um, that's, 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 yeah, well, mm -hmm. I, okay. well, I think I wanted our time to, is gone, actually. Yeah, yeah. if you allow me, I, I wanted to, um, we got how much? Five minutes more? Okay. If, if you allow me, I just want to, um, to, to make a further comment about this circular reasoning. Uh, no, 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 I'm not a philosopher, so don't get me wrong, but, you know, I, I took an introductory course on, uh, on philosophy and, and, and reasoning. And, uh, you know, I, I'm very particular about this thing about circular reasoning because, you know, circular reasoning doesn't prove anything. If I say, you know, why is A true because of B and why is B true because of A? So A is true because of B and B is true because of A, so you get nowhere. You know, you, just one thing proves the other one. You know, how do I know that I'm telling the truth because David said I'm telling the truth? How do I know that David is telling the truth when he said that I'm telling the truth? Well, because David, uh, I said that David is telling the truth. So A says that B is true and B says that A is true and the two confirm each other and the two are happy with each other, but nobody else should believe them. You have to have some independent reason for why. All right? It's like, uh, you know, the old argument for the existence of God. How do you know that God exists? Because the Bible says so. How do you know that the Bible is true? Because it is the Word of God. You see, <laughs> it's a circular reasoning. If you believed that the Bible was the Word of God, you wouldn't be asking the first question in the first place. So now, the thing about circular reasoning. Now, to escape the one circle that I spoke about, um, you, you said that, well, it is a personal thing. I mean, nobody can convince you that Jesus is God. It is the Spirit who comes in and convinces you, yep. right? Mm -hmm. But uh, notice that in order to get that Spirit, you already have to believe that Jesus is God. You have to respond as a Christian, and then you get that Spirit. Isn't that true? Mm. You no. get the Spirit before? No. How do yep. we get the Spirit then? Tell us about yep. how we get the Spirit. Well, right now. Jesus, Jesus says in the prediction about the coming of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit will convict of truth. Mm. Uh, without the Holy Spirit convicting of truth, I believe we are incapable of finding the truth. Um, so that's the work of the Holy Spirit, to convict of truth. The, so how, the, can the, I, how can I get the Holy Spirit? Like right now, if I want the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit right this moment so I can know the truth, how can I find the Holy Spirit now? Ask God. Okay, God, mm -hmm. give me whatever Holy <laughs> Spirit you have to give me and convince me of I'll the just, truth. Let, let me share my, my own... Um, um, I'll, I'll get very autobiographical. And that's, um, it, it's, uh, I, I, I was a child and went to bed one night and um, someone had, that day I'd been in church, someone had been talking about what we're talking now, about Jesus being the one whom God has sent as our Savior. And I went to bed that night and I couldn't sleep because I felt the Spirit of God calling me. I get out of bed and knelt by my bed and confessed before God that I am sinful. And said, I receive and accept the forgiveness that Jesus offers. I was then baptized with joy I got back into bed and I was then so joyful I couldn't sleep I got up early the next morning and went to the nearby church and um, sat there and covenanted with Christ to follow him all the days of my life that for me that event for me is the most significant event that has ever happened in my life and day by day I never cease getting over the wonder of it all that God called me through his spirit to say yes to Christ um, why he called me why he called me then I don't know but he did and it's made all the difference in my life all the difference in my life I'm absolutely settled and persuaded and joyously confident that I'm in the way and that's the spirit of God I uh, it's not it's not that Dave Shank is uh, was the extraordinary, or extraordinary, extraordinary child. I was a sinner. I was a sinner. But yeah. you see, yeah. mm -hmm. David, mm -hmm. in the very prayer that you made, you already started with an acceptance of Christ. And this is the problem. But you see, you it, see was, it was the yeah. Holy Spirit that persuaded me to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then you still have to explain how do you get the Holy Spirit. You see, this is the, this is the point. Mm -hmm. uh, you, from what I understand, in speaking with my Christian friends, mm -hmm. and even speaking with you here now, mm -hmm. 
You don't get the Holy Spirit until you first accept Christ. No? no? So you get the Holy Spirit let, before that. Let, yeah? me say, let me say this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you receive the Holy Spirit when you accept Christ. But I don't believe anyone is capable of coming to Christ. I'm sure no one is capable of coming to Christ unless the Holy Spirit calls. And that is why last night, mm -hmm. why last night, when you, my dear, dear friend, mm -hmm. dismiss those prophecies about the Holy Spirit as being prophecy in, in the book of John, mm -hmm. as being prophecies about the coming of a prophet, that grieves me because it's only through the Holy Spirit that one can find the truth. Mm -hmm. And when one just says, well, that's, that's a prophet, and the Holy Spirit is the presence of God with us. And you say, no, it's just a prophet. I think that is pushing aside the way in which God works with us. And uh, that's, that's why I, I, in conscience, I had to say last night, please don't do that. John 14 and 16, Jesus says, the Holy Spirit is going to come after I ascend to heaven. And he will convict the world of truth. If we say the Holy Spirit is not the, if we say those prophecies are not the Holy Spirit, then we're pushing that possibility of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we just say no. Yeah. Okay, yeah. finally mm -hmm. in conclusion then. You see, there are Muslims in this audience who have not accepted Christ mm -hmm. as in a Christian sense. And we should take it for granted they don't have the Holy Spirit. I don't think I have the Holy Spirit. And I don't think my Muslim friends do. All right, so if we don't have this Holy Spirit then, we could not understand anything that you're saying about Christ. That's true. That's true. So our dialogue is not going to be promising for anything. There's no way that you can convert our Muslim friends because they don't have the Holy Spirit, so they can't understand you. Until they get the Holy Spirit, they will not understand you. And all you're preaching here is just in vain. Unless the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Unless the Holy Spirit. Well, see, man, you're in big trouble. <laughs> right. Exactly right. All right. Exactly right. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I welcome you all back to the question and answer session. I hope this will also be very interesting and, and beneficial for all of us who are here. The procedure will go something like this. I will read out the question and then I'll invite the person to whom the question is addressed. And then they will answer that question specifically. And then I'll ask the other speaker a similar question and we'll do the same process until we have run out of questions. Insha'Allah, we will finish by 4.50. At that time, there will then be a summation, five minutes each, by both speakers. So I will call upon, first of all, Dr. David Schenk. I have one question for him. The first, first question is, how do you distinguish between the so-called Holy Spirit and the evil whispers of the devil? If the work of the Holy Spirit is, is, uh, is um, nudging us towards Christ and consistent with Christ, then that is of God. If the Holy Spirit is taking us in a different direction, then it's not of God. And that is the, that is the litmus test which the New Testament gives to us. Test the spirits. Test the spirits. If the spirit says that confesses Christ for who he is, in accordance to the New Testament witness, then then that's that's of God. If the spirit is taking us another direction, then it's not. <clears throat> Question for Brother Shabi Ali is this why do Muslims believe some of what Jesus said and not all of what he said? They say, surely a liar would lie about everything. Either that or all, all that he says is the truth. Uh, before I answer the question, I just want to take a brief moment to make a public apology. One of my Christian friends just pointed out to me during the break that uh, something I did earlier was not appropriate. The manner in which I prayed for the Holy Spirit uh, amounted, in his opinion, to a mockery of the Christian religion. And certainly this was not my intention and was not my intention to hurt him or any of the other Christians who are here. I was just trying to express my frustration in understanding how does one really get, get the Holy Spirit. And I, I thought to demonstrate, well, this is obviously not how you get it. And, and my Christian friend was right. This is not how, how you get the Holy Spirit. 
and uh, the, the manner in which I crudely demonstrated that uh, was, was obviously not right. So I apologize. It was not my intention to hurt anyone or to mock another religion. Now, the, in answer to this question, I should uh, say that first I disagree with the proposition that uh, either one tells the truth all of the time or one tells lies all of the time. Now, before we come to Jesus on whom be peace, uh, just as a general proposition, I mean, between black and white, there are so many different shades of gray. One might tell the truth, uh, you know, 60-40 or 70-30 and so on. So I disagree with that proposition. Second, Muslims believed in everything that Jesus on whom be peace said. We believe him to be a true prophet and messenger of God. There is nothing in the Islamic uh, uh, sources that indicate that Jesus on whom be peace ever committed a sin or ever told a lie. Uh, Muslims believe him to be a man of truth, a messenger and a prophet of God who would not go around telling falsehood. However, to find his true teachings, Muslims look at the glorious Quran, which I've demonstrated to be a book from God. And we can rely on the Quran as a true record of not only what Jesus taught, but what other prophets uh, in addition to him also taught. These are the revealed words of God telling us about what Jesus taught and what he said to his people. Now, my Christian friend who wrote this question obviously is wondering, why do Muslims accept some of the sayings of Jesus in the Bible and not accept some other sayings of Jesus in the Bible? And uh, my answer has to be that uh, Christian biblical scholars themselves have looked in the sayings of Jesus in the Bible and have found that not all of them are of equal uh, validity and reliability. For example, the sayings of Jesus in Mark's Gospel are uh, more surely authentic than the sayings of Jesus in John's Gospel. It is the different grades of authenticity. And uh, when John is compared with Mark, it is seen that John's Gospel do not uh, always uh, and often do not, does not, often does not record the, the true historical sayings uh, of the real Jesus. So Christian biblical scholars themselves uh, take some sayings as uh, truly representative of Jesus and some other sayings as not representative of the real Jesus. Okay, a question addressed to Dr. David Schenk it says, If Jesus is God, why does it say in the Bible, when a man came and bowed down to Jesus, he said, don't bow down to me, bow down to him. And then he pointed upwards. Here is a clear differentiation between Jesus and God. So how can Jesus be God? I don't have a clue what you're referring to. I don't recall any such uh, incident in the life of Jesus. <clears throat> this is a question to, to Shabi Ali. It says, we have Jesus in our hearts. So what difference does being a Muslim make in your life? How does that change who you are? I believe that Jesus was one of many prophets of God who came to teach the same essential message to all peoples, all times, all places. And that that uh, message of God uh, that was given through Jesus and other prophets have finally uh, been uh, revealed to us in the glorious Quran as a message that we should implement in our own lives and we should carry out in practice. So that Muslims not only have Jesus and other prophets in their hearts, but we do the things which Jesus and other prophets did. For example, we note from the New Testament that Jesus used to fast. Muslims also fast. It is said in the New Testament that Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights until he was hungry. And in those days he ate nothing. And uh, Muslims also fast uh, not for 40 days and 40 nights. I don't think uh, you know, we'll manage that much, but we do it for 30 days in the daylight hours uh, uh, alone. And uh, at least we're doing something that's, that's close to his practice. Uh, Jesus on whom be peace, according to the New Testament in Matthew chapter 26 verse 39, fell on his face and prayed. And you will note that today Muslims uh, do fall on their faces and, and pray. We, some of us just did that during the break. Uh, so not only do we have uh, Jesus in our heart uh, and our minds, but we also have him in our practice. We do the things which Jesus did. But more importantly, the belief that Jesus had is the belief that Muslims also have. When Jesus spoke about God, Jesus spoke about God being the one true God. And when a man came to him and, and called him good teacher and knelt before him, Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And so Jesus always pointed to someone else. So when he was asked which is the greatest of all the commandments, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And Muslims today say the same thing about God, that God is one. So not only do we have his practice, but also his belief. This is a question addressed to Dr. David Shank. It says, 
The name Yahweh is only a guess at the real name based on the tetragrammaton YHWH. Is it not possible that Jehovah or, or Allah is the right name? Uh, Jehovah is an Anglicized way of saying Yahweh, uh, which is the, the way the Hebrews say it. And uh, you're correct. It is, it is an estimation of what this name might have, might have been. Um, but the point is, as I read um, the, 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 uh, the um, uh, Exodus scripture that I read this afternoon, that um, in that encounter at the burning bush with Moses, God, known as Elohim by Abraham, reveals himself in a fresh new dimension as the righteous personal one who encounters, who meets us personally, I thou encounter. And, um, and, 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 he, and, he, and there's a new name for that understanding of God. The I am, the I was, the I will be, Yahweh. Um, now, I agree that we're not quite sure exactly how that Yahweh was expressed, but it is the Hebrew way of saying it. And the point that we need to remember and live with, I believe, the Bible gives witness to, is that God does encounter us. He seeks to encounter us, to meet us personally. And exactly how that name is pronounced, Yahweh or Jehovah or whatever, is, is somewhat beside the point to the core question. Have I experienced God as the one who encounters me? He seeks to encounter. <clears throat> this is a question for Shabi Ali. It says, if, as you said, anyone can rescue himself by raising his hands and looking to God for mercy, then can you tell us what will happen to your soul when you die? Will you go to heaven or to hell? It is not the Muslim way to arrogantly say, I am, I am saved, I am going to heaven. The promise of the Quran and the, the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is that one who uh, becomes a Muslim actually goes to paradise. Uh, the Quran says, "Inna ladina kalu Rabbun Allahu thumma stakamu tatanazalu alayhim al malaika tu Allah takafu wa la tahsanu wa abshiru bil jannati lati kuntum tu adun." As for those who say our Lord is Allah alone and they remain steadfast upon that, the angels de descend upon them, saying to them, uh, "We are, do, have no fear nor grieve, but uh, delight in the good news of the paradise which you are promised." So that is a promise for Muslim believers. Again, Again in the hadith, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhal al jannah. Whoever said la ilaha illallah, whoever said there is no God but Allah, has certainly entered paradise. Uh, to, uh, said in the past tense to, say, to show how certain that is. But at the same time, a Muslim uh, believing these and, and uh, hoping in this promise, and does not go around saying, I am I'm saved, because the future is something that is uh, there before us, we don't know. Maybe you believe in Christ today, but who knows, maybe tomorrow you believe in something else. Maybe today you're a Muslim, but who knows if tomorrow you might be something else. Uh, so we always depend upon the grace, the mercy, and uh, the guidance of God. Now, uh, I may compare that with, uh, you know, traveling to another country. If I have my visa ready, I have my passport in order, I bought my ticket, I'm sitting on the plane, and you ask me, are you going to London Heathrow? I'll say, Insha'Allah, I'm going to London Heathrow. If it be the will of Allah, I'll get there. It's not that, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely going there, because who knows the future? We put all of the future into the domain of Allah, the creator and the sustainer of the world. But yes, in essence, uh, the promise for Muslims is that uh, they will be going to paradise. This is a question for Dr. David Schenk. What's the difference between the New Testament and the Old One? And then it says, why did you bring in the New Testament? Very, very good question. I appreciate you raising it. Um, the, um, the, the, the beginning with Adam and Eve, God promised when he turned away from him in Genesis 3:15 that a son born to the woman will deal with evil, the evil in, in the metaphor form of a serpent. That verse says that the son will be wounded but will crush the head of the serpent. 
So right there at the dawn of human history, when humankind turn away from God, God promises a son who will come. And as for the next, for the next approximately 1,500 years, as the Bible developed, as the, script, as the biblical scriptures are written and developed, that, that promise, that theme, that a day will come when a son will be born who is going to bring salvation runs through the scriptures. Um, and at the end of Malachi, it, the, the promise is reinforced, the very end of the last chapter of the Bible, the son who will, who will be born. So that, that's, that's, that's consistent throughout the Old Testament. Then the New Testament is the announcement that he has come. This one who is promised has come of the line of David and on and on. All kinds of prophecies in the Old Testament about who this son will be, including, I believe, this, this Psalms 2-7 passage that was referred to earlier today. This son who will come, he came. And so that's the New Testament. And the story, the account of, of the Messiah, his work in ministry, which is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these different looks at who he is. I confess before you that I believe those Gospels to be true and authentic, and I am grieved when we permit so-called scholars to detract us from the truth of the scriptures. I don't think that is either Quranic or biblical. This Jesus who is described in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then after his crucifixion and resurrection, a church is formed, that's described in the book of Acts, and then the rest of the New Testament is teachings, letters written to churches and so forth, uh, developing the theology related to, to this Jesus who, who had walked among us. So that's the New Testament. Old Testament, getting ready for him to come. The New Testament has come in the formation of the church. This is a question for Shabi Ali. It says, Christians claim that the Father and the Son are equally important, but from the Christian way of life, we understand that the Son gets a higher value. For example, both Christian festivals are focused on Jesus and not to the Father. Then she says, or he says, having been a Christian and now a Muslim, I believe that Christians believe that they can receive more mercy from a being that has been a human and has gone through the struggle that we are going through than a being that is created like us. Please comment on that. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. It seems to be going in different directions. I would agree. <laughs> let me have a, let have, me have a go. Have a yeah. go. Yeah. So, all right. Uh, first of all, a part of the question is about uh, the Christian devotion to, to Jesus, and to some extent, that this would appear that Jesus is held uh, in, in higher esteem than, than the Father. Uh, that is something I won't comment upon too much because that will be something that more in the domain for David to, to explain. Uh, although I can compound the question for David by saying that uh, I've noted that uh, some Christian theologians have already pointed out this to be a problem because, you know, one tends to see God the Father as, as this uh, um, uh, severe, uh, strict judge who, who requires the blood of the people unless his own son comes and, and gives the blood. And the son comes in and he is loving and kind. He, you know, he loves the people and so he dies in their stead. Uh, so the father appears to be cruel, the son appears to be loving, and who does one love more in response? One loves the son more, and so on. So this is a problem, I think, for David to, to look into, and I, I wouldn't be able to answer that. Now, this person is, used to be a Christian and now is a Muslim and believes the Christians believe that they can receive more mercy from uh, a being that has been a human and has now gone through the struggle we are going through uh, than the being that created us. Uh, oh, I see, okay. So, uh, having been a Christian himself, now, or herself, this writer is saying that uh, uh, Christians think that they can receive um, a, a more mercy from 
a, a God who became man than a God who did not become man. And perhaps it re this refers to the Christian common uh, saying that, uh, you know, Jesus became man, God became man in order to experience what humanity is about. So he can be more compassionate towards human beings. Um, and whether or not uh, that really is a better way of looking at things. Well, from a Muslim point of view, we think that God knows everything always. God does not have to become a man to know what man is about. It's like he didn't have to become a woman to know what pregnancy and childbirth is all about. And uh, God does not have to become a animals to know what the animals experience. God knows everything always. And so Muslims would find it odd to hear from our Christian friends that God became man in order to experience what uh, humanity is is all about. In fact, there is no way that God could have experienced what humanity is about if we take the Christian explanation even. Because listen, if Jesus was God who now became man, he had to keep knowing that he is God. So one does not really experience what humanity is about if he walks around thinking that he is God. We don't walk around thinking that we're God. So if Jesus was God, he couldn't really have experienced what humanity is about. I think. Or if somebody disagrees, this, this is for them to explain. Okay, this is a question from Dr. David Schenk, and it touches on something he mentioned earlier, but hopefully he will go into it in a bit more detail. It says, David speaks of personal experience uh, of the Holy Spirit, but Hindus speak of milk-drinking idols and experiences with their gods. Most religions have such experiences. How do you know which of these are true and which are not, even even some Muslims claim contact with the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Very, very good, a very good question. And um, um, I'll just, again, confess where, where I'm at in this. I believe that the Spirit of God is at work all over the world, um, uh, seeking to convince people of truth. Jesus said the Spirit will come, he'll be the Spirit of truth. And I believe that after the event of Christ, the Spirit of God was poured out around the world in a way that was not true before the event of Christ. The Old Testament spirits worked too, as well. And what is the work of the Holy Spirit? To convince people of truth, to point people toward the truth. Um, and so you find hints and indications of truth in Hinduism and Buddhism and so forth it's the, the, that, that, that is present. But the biblical confession the New Testament confession, which I embrace, is that Christ, the Messiah, is the incarnation, the infleshness of all truth. And so the criterion by which all truths should be measured is Jesus the Messiah. So if the Spirit is working in a Hindu context, um, the question that that, that, that I, as a Christian, ask as I look at that spirit that is work is, is this consistent with the spirit of Jesus the Messiah? Does this point toward him? He is the enfleshment of all truth. Um, and um, this is one reason that the church believes in missions so deeply. I personally have been involved in a global missions movement. Um, I have lived in context where the church was not present. Why did I go there? Because I believe the Spirit is already working, preparing people to receive Jesus the Messiah as the central point of God's action in history. But people can't believe in him unless definitively, fully, unless they hear of him. The scriptures say, the truth is near you, it's even in your mouth. But how can you believe unless someone proclaims the gospel to you? And so that is the task of the church around the world to proclaim this one who is, uh, who is um, the event of God's saving action among us, the Messiah. And the Spirit says, Amen, 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 to that proclamation. <clears throat>
Jesus on whom be peace uh, was a prophet messiah and there is no difficulty with a prophet messiah being killed if he was killed that would not affect uh, anything that, that Muslims uh, believe in within the theology of, of Islam but the Quran says he was not killed uh, by the Jews nor was he crucified by them it was made so to appear to them Muslim commentators on the Quran have said that somebody was made to look like Jesus and that somebody was put on the cross and uh, killed and crucified uh, instead of Jesus in the meantime Jesus was raised uh, into heaven the Quran says, but Rafa'ahu Allahu ilai. God raised him to himself. Now, who was that someone who was made to appear like Jesus and who was crucified instead? Uh, some uh, commentators have said that uh, a companion of, of Jesus, one of his followers, was offered the opportunity to be with Jesus in paradise by taking his place on the cross. And this uh, companion, a young man from among them, agreed to do that. Uh, some others have said that Judas Iscariot, the one who uh, tried to get Jesus arrested and crucified, was himself made to look like Jesus and he was crucified receiving the punishment that he uh, sought to give to his master. And so whoever it is that was crucified is not specified in the Quran but is uh, discussed in Muslim commentaries on the Quran and there seems to be very good reasons for believing that Judas Iscariot was the one who was in fact uh, crucified. We know that the New Testament cannot come up with a single uh, narrative of uh, what happened to Judas Iscariot and it seems that two different narratives were made up concerning his demise. Um, one in Matthew's Gospel and the other in Acts of the Apostles. But many uh, scholars, for example Raymond Brown, uh, looks at these narratives and says that these two narratives were made up concerning uh, Judas Iscariot by looking at uh, what was understood from the Old Testament. So the writers went to the Old Testament to find out what might have happened to somebody like Judas Iscariot and then uh, looking at two different passages in the Old Testament, Matthew wrote it one way and Luke wrote it another way. Uh, but uh, the fact of what happened to Judas Iscariot could not be known from the New Testament. So it seems that uh, the writers looked around and they noticed that uh, Jesus used to have uh, 12 disciples and uh, one is gone and two different stories emerge as to what really happened to him in, in the end. It says, how do you explain the many contradictions in the Bible? And knowing this fact, how is it possible to call people to a book that is supposedly from God, but yet is so contradictory? Well, I um, am perplexed by that question. I'm not sure what the person means by contradictions in the Bible. Um, so um, I, uh, I don't know why I should answer that question. I don't believe that the Bible is contradictory. I believe that the Bible does uh, record uh, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, the acts of God uh, over many, many centuries. And that that revelation is a developing revelation culminating in Jesus the Messiah that I do believe and um, there is um, there is uh, a movement forward in that revelation uh, century by century culminating in, in the Messiah we do uh, I believe and there's, there's a strong theological stream that embraces this that the uh, the Jesus uh, is the eyes through which we should interpret the Bible we call this a Christ-centered hermeneutic uh, Jesus invites us to do that um, in the New Testament. He'll say, it was said of old. He's referring to Moses when he says that in the Torah. But I say to you, I've come to fulfill the former, to clarify it, uh, to, um, to, to bring to pass what the former was talking about. But the former doesn't have the last word. For example, the former scriptures say, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who do, do, do wrong to you. If that's by what you mean by contradiction, uh, it, 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 uh, it is true that in the Bible there is a development of revelation culminating in Jesus Christ. But I wouldn't call that contradictions. This is a question for Shabir Ali. It says, can the concept of guidance in Islam be associated with the Christian belief of the experience of the so-called Holy Ghost. 
We believe as Muslims that in fact God does give us guidance and we pray to God for guidance continuously in all of our five daily prayers. In every cycle of the prayer we have to recite uh, what, what is referred to as the Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter of the glorious Quran. And in that opening chapter we say, Ihdina Surat Al-Mustaqeem, show us the, the right path. And Muslims should be confident that we will be shown the right path uh, if, uh, if, if we are Muslims, because our Christian friends tell us that uh, th their Bible says, seek and you shall find, ask and it will be given to you, knock and it will be opened uh, to you. So if we are seeking, according to our Christian friends, we will find. So we should be uh, satisfied with that. But more to the question, uh, the Quran tells us that God sends down the uh, Ruh al-Qudus, the, um, you know, the, the Holy Spirit, which we take to be the angel Gabriel, uh, to be a helper and uh, a guide to believers, whether it be Muslim believers in, in this century, or whether it be Muslim believers who lived with and walked with Jesus on whom be peace. The Quran tells us that even Jesus himself was aided by the Holy Spirit. And we believe that uh, that uh, Spirit of God is still uh, aiding believers everywhere. But Muslims do not lay that emphasis on the Holy Spirit uh, as a guide and do not lay that much emphasis on the guidance of God as the defining factor in, in, in a discussion because we realize that when we come to a discussion like this one, it, it is pointless to say, well, I am on the right guidance and you say, well, I am on the right guidance and I say, well, it ain't so and you say, well, it is and, and, and so on. We have to present reason, evidence and proof for what we believe. I think that one in a dialogue such as this one relying and saying, well, you know, I have the spirit that guides me or I just pray to God and therefore he's guiding me. I think this is a cop out from the discussion itself. It, one has to have, uh, you know, a, a way in which a thing can be proved or disproved. And we have to look at these ways. We have to look at the reason, the evidence uh, and the proofs instead of just relying on the guidance that we have from God. There's a question here for Dr. David Schenk. It says, why do Christians baptize their children and what happens to the child who died without baptism? Uh, I come from a tradition that does not baptize children. So maybe we should ask a priest here or someone from the Anglican Church or Lutheran Church who baptize children on that one. But uh, there, are, there are different theologies within the Christian movement, certainly in relationship to baptism. I'll just say that within the community that I'm a part of, we baptize adults, believing that uh, baptism is a sign, um, like circumcision had been in the Old Testament. It's a sign of the new uh, covenant relationship with God of our redemption. The baptism is with water, a sign of being washed, our sins washed away, and coming into this new community. And in my community, church, we believe that that should be an adult decision. You can't, uh, child, children uh, can't, you can't, de parent, parents cannot determine the faith of the children. That, that's something that, that adults should decide. And that goes back to the 16th century Anabaptist movement, which broke with the state church systems that baptized infants. Now churches that baptize infants say, well, we baptize them to bring them into the covenant community, showing that they're loved by God, and then when they become 12 or so, they make the final decision, or they make a, a, a further decision as to a decision as to whether they will continue in the faith or depart from it, and then they have the confirmation. Uh, and of course, um, there are some Christian communities that believe that the baptism itself is a sacrament of grace that does redeem the child. I personally do not embrace that. I don't. I don't see biblical foundations for that. Although there are certainly Christian communities that do embrace that theology. I believe we're saved by God's grace in Christ and that uh, baptism is a sign of that grace. Okay, this is a question to Shabir Ali. I think he touched on it in his speech anyway. It says, what evidence is there to prove that the Qur'an is authentic? Well, I, I would interpret this question uh, as, uh, in two ways. One, uh, how do we know this really is a revelation from the Almighty God? And I, I've covered that in, in my speech. Uh, I've shown that uh, if, it, if it were authored by a human being, that would have to be the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's the human being that history knows to be first associated with this book. If it came from a man, it came from him. But uh, there are good reasons for thinking that it didn't come from him. Uh, he was incapable of writing a book. 
he was too sincere to say that this book uh, came from God if really it was coming from him. And he couldn't have been sincerely wrong because uh, the, a, a psychological examination proves that this could not have been his own writing. The book criticizes him. A historical investigation proves it couldn't have come from him because it relates facts that were not known in his environment. Uh, looking at the prophecies in, in, in the Quran shows that it could not have come from him because uh, no one can write a book and then make the future obey the book. And looking at the scientific statements in the Quran again is a confirmatory uh, proof that this is uh, a revelation from the Almighty God. Trying to disprove it just leads to the same conclusion. Trying to prove it wrong by finding errors in it just uh, you know, turns up a blank page. We, we cannot find errors in the book and that shows that it's not of human origin. Um, and, and moreover, uh, nobody is able to produce a book like this one. If it were of human origin, then surely somebody can do something like that. If somebody invents Pepsi, someone will come up with Coke. And if somebody invents 7-Up, someone will come up with Sprite. Uh, why is it that millions of books have been written in the world, but not another book like the Quran, although the Quran is daring its enemies and critics and skeptics to produce a book like this one to show that it is a human invention? Nobody's been able to do that. Now, the second way in which I would interpret the question is to ask, how do we know that the book we have today is the same book that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, some 1400 years ago? Well, some of my previous answers already shed light on this question because notice that from my answer, I'm looking at the contents of the book that we have today. And that is showing that the book we have today is really a revelation from the Almighty God. But moreover, as we look back over the history of the Quranic text, how it came to be transmitted over time, we can be sure today that this book that we have is agreed upon by uh, scholars throughout that it is uh, identical to the Quran as existed some 1400 years ago. Uh, scholars who are not Muslims would uh, say that uh, the Quran as we have today uh, is the same as was produced under the direction of the Caliph Uthman. Uh, who uh, gave this directive some 14 years after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had passed away. I think if our Christian friends had a book which uh, was authenticated by the disciples of Jesus within a few years after his death, they would hold on to that as a very authentic book and record of Jesus' teachings. And uh, likewise, Muslims having this book, which according to non-Muslim scholarship, is a book that goes back to 14 years within the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, authenticated and agreed upon by the companions and disciples of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Muslims can then be sure and satisfied that we have the original revelation of God. The question for Dr. David Schenk, it says, does it not say in the Bible that another messenger will follow after Jesus? Um, no, it does not say that. It does, it does um, warn that there will be prophets, leaders, religious movements that will seek to detract us from Jesus Christ and his centrality and that we should um, not in any way be detracted by such movements or leaders uh, when they come and if they come. Uh, but uh, there's, there's, no, there's no prophecy in the New Testament of another prophet who is to come who will have any word uh, of authority beyond that of Jesus, of the Messiah. <clears throat> this is a question for Shabbi Ali. It says, why can't you accept without seeing? After all, the Bible does say that blessed are those who believe without seeing. It says, I agree Islam has substantial facts to support it, but it doesn't mean that Christianity is less valid or important. That it is important to believe in even what we do not see. In fact, the Quran speaks about uh, people who uh, are, are Muslims and, and says, you know, Alladina um, bil ghaib, those who believe in the unseen. Muslims are described as people who do believe in the unseen, and after all, we believe in the unseen God. Uh, however, I do not think that we should blindly follow a faith which is logically self contradictory which um, is uh, obviously uh, false in some of its parts, uh, or any, anything of such nature. We should examine our faith. If the faith does not stand up to examination, then there's no reason to believe in it further. Let me make a distinction between two things. There is so much that we can examine on a human level, using reason, using historical studies, using archaeology, using... Uh, uh, scientific methods, uh, there, there's so much that we can do there. 
And then there is so much above that that we cannot examine. We cannot put God in a test tube. So that which we cannot examine, we have to, ac uh, we have to accept on faith. Muslims and Christians will agree on that. But that which we can examine on the human level, we should examine. No one should come to us and say, no, no, don't examine that, you know, because uh, you should just believe that on faith, or you should just, you know, you have the Holy Spirit, so don't look at that. No, we should look at that. We should ask historical questions. We should ask questions like, for example, what determining factor was there to make anyone with good reason proclaim that Jesus is God, for example? That's a historical question. There must have been something definitive that Jesus said that made sure that he is God. Or something definitive that he did that made sure that he is God. Now no one should come and say, well, okay, believe that without seeing or believe that without hearing. Because if Jesus did not say he was God, nobody could have proclaimed him to be God without hearing him say that. Or if he didn't do something that proves that he is God, nobody should take him for God. Just like nobody should take Moses for God. Nobody can, should come and say, well, you know, I think Mother Teresa was a God. You know, look, she was a good lady. Right? There, there has to be some good definitive reason for believing that a person was God. Otherwise, we shouldn't. We cannot just accept something on blind faith alone just because somebody tells us that we should believe that. The last question, and it's for Dr. David Schenk. It says, being a person with a lot of intellect and knowledge, has it never come across you that maybe Islam is the truth and maybe you should consider embracing Islam? That, that is a very, very uh, good question. I thank you for it. Yeah. I have, um, uh, in 1963, my wife and I uh, packed our bags in North America and went to Somalia, a Muslim country, um, as, uh, as Christian missionaries. And uh, had 10 very, very wonderful years there. Then I moved to Nairobi, Kenya, when the Marxists took over Somalia and moved into the Muslim area of Nairobi. And then in the United States, I've continued to relate quite closely to Muslims in the United States. And uh, I've had many, many conversations in mosques in, in East Africa, as well as in the United States, uh, concerning faith questions analogous to what we're doing this afternoon um, along the way. And um, I, uh, in the deepest, uh, deepest recesses of my soul, I feel the tug as to why Islam is very, very attractive and powerful. I feel that tug. I think I understand its power and its attraction. Um, and I have learned to respect my Muslim friends very, very deeply. Having said that, as I feel that tug I also give thanks for Jesus because I find him to be unsurpassable. Um, and so while I feel the tug of Islam, I rejoice in the salvation that I experience in Jesus Christ and never ever want to forsake that precious gift. Um, thank you for that question. <clears throat> Now is the time for the summation of both parties, so I'll call upon, I'll call upon first Dr. David Schenk, I hope he doesn't mind coming back up again. So it'll be five minutes for the first speaker and then five minutes for Shabir Ali. So I must say, and uh, three hours, uh, we have been actively engaged up here and uh, you have been very, very patient. I, uh, I admire you very much and I must commend the group of university students who came together on a Wednesday afternoon when I know you have exams and studies and all of that for the conversation that's been going on this afternoon which certainly shows I believe that the issues that we're talking about all of us feel very very deeply about and um, I, um, I commend you and thank you for inviting us um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion this afternoon about circular reason and I've been trying to understand what you mean by that I've studied logic too, and uh, uh, it, over the years, and uh, think I, I know what it is, but I do not understand why <laughs> what I've been saying this afternoon is perceived as being circular reasoning. Uh, what I've attempted to do 
is to confess God as we experience God in, uh, in the Christian way, uh, which, uh, and in light of biblical revelation. Um, and uh, that experience of God is a response to his acts within history, within our lives, within our communities. And, um, and God keeps acting, keeps acting in our lives, keeps moving forward uh, with us as we, as we walk with him in, in the pilgrimage of life. And I always think of it as thy kingdom come, thy will be done, future and now, a movement forward, uh, not as a, a circular sort of thing. So I have some perplexity on, uh, on those concerns this afternoon. I'd like to just wrap up with several words from Scripture. Um, Luke writing, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. The opening paragraph to Luke's Gospel Luke very concerned to communicate Jesus Christ as the church, as the apostles had experienced Christ accurately and authentically. John, writing perhaps later, although some current scholarships actually puts John as the first gospel that is currently under scholarly scrutiny, but John writing Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Luke and John. And then close to the end of his life, John writes an epistle, a letter to one of the churches. And this is what he says. That which for us from the beginning, which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We've seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Thank you. In my summation, I'd like to return to where we began. After praising God and sending peace and salutations upon uh, the, all of his prophets, you will recall that uh, I spoke about reason uh, as a, a help towards discovering God and then revelation as a completion of that discovery, uh, giving us the information that we could not discover through reason. What I'd like to now uh, clarify a little bit further would I think be explained if I tell you a little story. There was this insane person and his psychiatrist. The insane man thinks that he is dead. And the psychiatrist is trying every which way to explain to this insane person that he is still alive. And uh, eventually, when every argument failed, the psychiatrist deliberately cut the hand of this insane person to let it bleed and said to him, you see, you're bleeding, so you must be alive. And this madman just replied, well, that just goes to show you, doc, dead men do bleed. <laughs> <laughs> and what this illustrates is that if you have a belief which is immune from disproof. It could be any belief. You could be happy with it, and nobody can prove you wrong. There has to be a way that a belief can be disproved if it were false. Now, my position that I put before you were based on two things. One, the reason, and two, the confirming revelation. Either of this could be disproved. You could, reason, you could use reason in reply to my arguments from reason. Or you can prove my scripture to be wrong. Or you can prove that my ideas are not firmly based on the scripture. 
These are ways in which you can disprove what I have said. On the other hand, I think that, uh, again, from my perspective, David obviously has a different perspective, I think that what David has presented is immune from proof. Because there is no way that we can prove that David does not have the Holy Spirit. You notice that everything that David said has boiled down to a single point. The revelation that David relies upon to make him believe that Jesus is God is the Holy Spirit working within him. Now to me this leads to circular reasoning. How do you believe that Jesus is God? Because I have the Holy Spirit. How do you know you have the Holy Spirit? Because I profess the right thing about Christ. Notice that David himself said that according to the scriptures, you must test the prophets. You must test the spirits. How do you know that you have the right spirit? Because that is the spirit within you who will testify the right thing concerning Christ. So how do you know that you have the right spirit? Because you have a spirit within you that tells you that Christ is God. How do you know that Christ is God? Because you have a spirit within you that's telling you that Christ is God. How do you know that's the right spirit? Because it tells you that Christ is God. How do you know that Christ is really God and that this spirit is not wrong? Because I have the spirit. How do you know you have the spirit? Because I have Christ. And so on. So it gets around in a circular reasoning that cannot be disproved. It is just immune from disproof. It is the same circular reasoning that is used to interpret the Old Testament. The Old Testament spoke about one God. Before believing Jesus to be the second person in the Holy Trinity, one reading the Old Testament would conclude with their fellow Jews that there is only one God. That was the message of the Old Testament. It is only after believing Jesus to be the second person of the Holy Trinity that Christians go back to the Old Testament and reinterpret that to make it a book that speaks about Jesus. So that whereas in the second psalm, God speaks to David, saying to David, You are my son, this day I have begotten you. Now Christians can read that about Jesus and say, See, that psalm was already speaking about Jesus. You see, there's a circular reasoning. How do you know that Jesus is the begotten son of God? Because the psalm already said it. How do you know the psalm is speaking about him? Because he is the begotten son of God. There's a circular reasoning from which there is no escape and which cannot be disproved, it is immune from disproof. But if you have a belief which is immune from disproof, that belief could very well be as false as the man who believed that he was dead. So finally, what rests solidly on the evidence? In my opinion, solidly on the evidence is the belief that there is only one God. That is the belief that we arrive at from reason, and that is the belief that has been confirmed to us through the revelation which can be checked, which could be disproved if it were false, and which is demonstrably true, proven true, through the arguments which I've given you. That one God sent his prophet, his messenger Jesus, and other messengers besides. They were human beings who conveyed to us the message about the one God to whom we should turn in order to be saved. That is the one God whom we pray to and we bow down to and we ask his forgiveness. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone for having turned up and thank our speakers for having come and given us a, a very informative and, and an enlightening talk. I'm sure that both of them will be available afterwards, inshallah, for questions if you have any. I'm sure some of you may be bursting, because there may be lots of follow-ups to the questions which you have made. So, I'd just like to call on our brother here who will give some announcements. After that, he'll read Surat al asr which will officially close our debate for today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.